Other speakers today will give you the practicalities of time banking and how it works in reality. I'm going to try and put this into the strategic context um, of, of government. What I'd say from the start though is my focus is mainly on older people. Time banking is not about older people. Time banking is inter and multi-generational and it has to be if it's going to work properly. But my focus, if, if, it, if it feels, if it's focusing on older people, that's because that's my, that's my area. Okay, we'll go on to the first bit. I'm not sure if you can see this all, but this is a quote from the Christie Commission on the future delivery of public services. And essentially it's repeating what Edgar Kahn said. Um, we have a situation, not just in Scotland, but throughout the world, where we're all getting older. I looked in the mirror this morning, and I, just to confirm, I was, and uh, yes, I am. We're all getting older, there's more office, and at the same time, we have a situation where the economy is in decline. So we're trying to have to find money where there isn't money to do things where we've, we've done them for, for 60 years. It just simply isn't the, the resource. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that Edgar's right that the, the operating system is broken yet, but certainly it's looking a bit fuzzy. So we're going to have to find a different way of doing things. And what Scottish Government's response to that is, is a programme known as Reshaping Care for Older People. And that's basically looking at doing things differently in three ways. It's looking at how we provide care on care pathways. In other words, when we do care. So instead of waiting until, instead of reacting to care, somebody breaks their hip and we have to operate and look after them in hospital, we're trying to look at preventative measures upstream as they say. So ways of actually doing things differently when we do care. Care settings, trying to do more in the communities and people's homes rather than in hospitals and in care homes. And thirdly and perhaps more challenging than any is community capacity and co-production and that's about how we do care, a different way of actually doing care. And in order to facilitate this, Scottish Government have come up with 300 million pounds over four years which to try and facilitate that change in, um, in the way we do things. Co-production, community capacity, time banking, all rely on assets. And you heard Edgar Khan mention assets. We are all assets. And the assets-based approach recognizes that we as individuals, our families and communities, have resources. We have skills, local knowledge. If, if we have a long-term condition, we're probably more of an expert in that than some of the clinicians. We know what it's like to live with that. So we can help other people with that condition. And we have supportive social networks, and we have skills, as, as has been said before me, people may have gardening skills, they may have knitting skills, they may have the, the skills of the expert patient. And by using those skills with the, the resources that we've actually got within statutory services, we can actually deliver services in a way that we get better value as citizens and we also create better value for public resources because we're working together. And so the idea of, of using assets through co-production and community capacity is that we can, public sector organisations can, can better use their own resources with, by, by working with people because we're not doing everything for people or to people, we're doing things with people. So we're starting on the basis that you've got a resource, we've got resources, by working together we can maximise those resources. The example I always give is about diabetics. If diabetics had to rely on healthcare professionals to give them their insulin injection every morning, that the NHS would be broke. We rely on those people to manage their own care, to use their brains and their manual dexterity to actually look after their diet, look after their exercise and give themselves their insulin. And if we didn't rely on the assets that those people represented, we wouldn't be able to actually provide the services. So it's about people seeing what they can do and professionals supporting what they can't do and working together. So that's the assets-based approach. Um, Co-production, if we move on. Co-production is basically what I've just said. It's a collaborative process where public services are planned and delivered in an equal and reciprocal arrangement. We talked about reciprocity. A reciprocal arrangement and relationship between the professionals 
and the people using the services in their families and communities. So we're co-producing, we are producing the services together just like the diabetics. In actually making best use of the resources that we've got in the community, community capacity building is something that, that we need to do. People may have latent skills, they may have skills that they, they, they don't know they have, but they can be built up, they can be trained to do things, they can be helped to do something. Before people were diabetics, they didn't know how to give themselves an injection, but once they've been trained to do it, they can actually, they can provide their own health care. That's just one example. But <coughs> building up the community capacity is about actually trying to uh, encourage the latent skills that people have, the intelligence that people have to actually provide more for their own care. If you look at the Paralympics, I'm sure people didn't know how to win a 100 meter race with one leg until they lost the leg, but they've learned how to use that prosthesis and they've used it to they can run the hell up uh, faster than I can. Uh, but that's about building up their capacity to actually use the skills they have along with the, 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 the support that could be provided from professionals. So, if we move on then, where does this lead into time banking? Well, all of these underpinning philosophies and concepts link into time banking. It's about networks of people. It's about communities and neighborhoods based on mutual self-help. You've heard, you've heard about the fact that it's an R for an R, but it's recognizing that people have skills. They have something that they can trade, they can use to, to mutually benefit their community or their families. And that's simply based on the assets they have and they can work in, uh, they can work in co-production with their neighbors to actually produce better services. So uh, just a second. These are all great concepts. The whole idea that we have a community, uh, communities who have got resources, who've got assets that we can actually utilize in public services is absolutely fantastic. And the fact that we can use time banking to uh, release these services is a great idea. But there are problems with this. There are challenges. And the challenges are that if I'm a chief executive of a health board or a chief executive of a council, if you want me to actually give it even a little bit of money to support time banking, why should I? I've got a very tight budget. Um, I know what I get if I spend £50,000 in hip operations. I maybe get 10 hip operations. I can count those. But with time banking, it actually delivers a lot of services in the community which supports vague concepts. Why should I actually do that? Well, what we're trying to do in West Edinburgh Time Bank is to try and build up some evidence about how time banking, by using assets in the community, actually does contribute to uh, the better utilization of statutory resources. And we're using two measures to actually identify that. We're using the Warwick and Edinburgh Mental Health and Wellbeing Scale. So we're, we're trying to evidence that when we, when somebody has a time bank intervention, what was the difference between what it was like before for them, what was the difference afterwards, how did it affect their mental health and well-being? And secondly, we're using talking points, which is a personal outcomes approach. It starts with trying to understand what would make things better for a person, design a service using the time bank that we can, we can put in to support that person and then measure it afterwards to see how that's improved. And this is about building up evidence that time banking actually contributes to the better use of resources and to the better health and well-being of individuals. So a couple of case studies quickly. Um, I'm sorry this is so small. I, the last time I showed it, it was a massive big screen, but uh, it's, it's hard to say. But we can't circulate the, 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 the overheads. This, this is Mrs. A. Now, she had a, a number of strokes. She was housebound with limited mobility. Um, the West Edinburgh Time Bank visited Mrs. A, explained what they could do for her, and now she's got somebody to help her with her shopping. Somebody comes in and visits her and befriends her. And basically, she is reporting benefits in terms of her mental health and well-being. And when we, when we measured the most important points, it was about having good social contacts, being able to get around her home, living the way she wanted to live. And we measured the difference between her mental health and well-being uh, at the start of the time bank intervention, and then three months after, and we saw significant improvement in that. And what we'll do is we'll continue to measure that over a, a period of two years. So once we've got 40 case studies, we'll be able to use that as evidence that these are actually having a positive impact on people's health. Just one other one quickly. 
mystery. This is an interesting one because um, uh, mystery is actually housebound and was very concerned about the fact that what could he do to actually pay back, to actually uh, generate credits that, uh, so he wasn't always taking, he didn't want to be beholden to, to the time bank. Well, West Edinburgh Time Bank have a link in with um, Her Majesty's Prison in Edinburgh. The prisoners do some voluntary work within, and again you heard Edgar Cahn talk about that uh, in, in England and Scotland. This is one of the prisons where they do some work, they create credits, and they donate those to West Edinburgh Time Bank. So what happens here is that Mr. E, because he can't do much for himself, doesn't necessarily mean that he can't participate in the Time Bank, because the prison credits are actually allocated to his account. And it isn't just prisons, it's, you know, neighbours can do it, um, uh, family members can do it, they can actually undertake some activities, uh, undertake an hour's work and donate those into the, 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 uh, the accounts of others. And if we look at how that's impacted upon him, his score again has, uh, has increased sig significantly and that's after three months. So we're starting to actually build up these, these, uh, these case studies which demonstrate that there is an impact and improvement but you've still got to go further. You've still got the evidence. How is this impacting clinically upon the health and well-being of individuals to prove this is something an investment, why investment should take place? And some of the early observations that we've actually seen within this particular project are the impact on social isolation. There is a plethora of evidence about how social isolation in the elderly can impact upon their mental health and well-being. Um, the, the, the way we respond to that uh, traditionally through statutory services is not good. Um, if somebody's socially isolated, a lot of the time we say, well, really dear, you should be in a home. You know, you'll have lots of company there. It'll be much better for you. That isn't what we're being told by people. What they want to do is they want to be part of the community. They want to be able to link in. And through time banking um, and, and other services like befriending, etc., which time banking can, can provide, people are actually able to remain in their own home and the impact on social isolation and uh, combating that through time banking is very powerful. So what you're doing is you're linking the concept of time banking with improvement in mental health and well-being to clinical evidence. That is a way of identifying and proving that this has a positive impact. But it's important for funders that they know that this is important because otherwise the chief executive will say, well, there's no proof for this because I can't measure it, I can't count how, how, how a person feels. I mean, you know, if somebody says, well, I feel a lot better, well, how do I count that and measure that that's having an impact on my budget? Falls is another area, and one of the things that we find in all of the case studies is mobility. Mobility is a big issue. Falls cost the NHS millions of pounds a year. And what we find is that by actually uh, helping people with their mobility, and we have volunteers going in from the time bank to look at things as simple as whether floor coverings are okay, whether somebody has got the right length of, of walking stick, etc. By doing this sort of thing and supporting people, we can help to reduce the number of falls. Also by accompanying people to shopping, etc. People going outside who are unsteady, we can support that as well. And again, there's, there's, a, there's a, a vast amount of evidence that shows the impact of combating falls. So, that's fine. Um, what we're trying to do with this particular project is say, time banking is a great idea, but it's not just about the cozy, you know, fluffy bit of time banking we're interested in. We, want time, we, we feel that time banking has a significant contribution to make towards actually uh, redressing the balance of this demogra demographic and economic um, time bomb we're about to face. And we feel that by evidencing <coughs> the impact of time banking and linking it to clinical evidence, we can actually demonstrate that it is an important area where funding bodies should invest in. So these are some of the recommendations. They're my own. They're not the Scottish government. I have to say that. Um, we are undertaking uh, a longitudinal study, but basically that needs to continue. And one of the things I would suggest to time banks, if you're setting them up, you do need to build in something that will evaluate your time bank. Because you might get a little bit of money from somewhere because you know it's a voluntary organization. It's a good idea. We'll give you some. But what happens if the money runs out? You want to be in a position to demonstrate that this is actually of value to your funders. So you need to actually evaluate. 
statutory partners, and this is the rule of the Scottish Government, statutory partners need to recognise the potential value of harnessing community assets through um, processes like time banking. And one of my roles is to ensure that I'm actually demonstrating and feeding back into Scottish Government the, the potential and the actual delivery of time banks and how that actually impacts upon um, the way we do business. I'll just finish with, uh, with a quote from um, Edgar Kahn because I've been fortunate enough to meet him twice. Um, what Edgar says is that we have, everything, uh, uh, we have everything we need if we use everything we've got. And what he means by that is that within the community there is so much potential out there that is underutilized but if we actually identify it, then we can overcome the deficit in our needs. So that's the view from St Andrew's House. Thank you.